Let's get to it's a perfect segue uh, into your New York Times bestselling book, Giannis, The Improbable Rise of an NBA MVP, um, which you wrote in real time and published just as he won uh, the NBA <laughs> championship a couple of years ago. Like, um, But my favorite, perhaps my favorite nugget that I, I got from you hearing you talk about that process was that despite how much of that book was devoted to Milwaukee and its relationship with the Bucks. The organization didn't help you at all, mm-hmm, you know. Mm-hmm. So I, w- I would love it if you could take us through a because it started through, uh, you know, you're doing a story about his brother, mm-hmm. or one of his brothers. Uh, it led to this this book on Giannis, but just your process of having to like break down barriers and and, and walls because there's so many obstacles in the way of access nowadays yeah. back in my day it was different i mean look there's Miriam, as you know there are so many athletes who have just cut out the middle man or woman in in this case as in us that own their own content that have their own content companies or content plays that have their own podcasts or or teams that that do the content themselves where they don't need uh, a, a third party to tell their stories and yet here you are constantly finding a way to uh, inform us and enlighten us about people that we don't know much about, starting with obviously Giannis's biography. So kind of take us through that process of landing that, that opportunity, but then uh, seeing it to fruition despite any obstacles that were in the way. Yeah. So I, like I said, I really wanted to do a book for a really long time. Um, and basically like you have to get a literary agent and then you have to write a proposal. And so I maybe wrote like two or three, like serious, legit proposals on other topics. And I would send it to different like literary agents and proposals and, you know, all, all that. And the feedback was like, I like you, but you're too young. I think you're on the rise. Not quite there yet. I love hmm. you, but don't think your idea will sell. <laughs> so it was wow. like not quite it was like it was like something with me or something with the idea. And the hard part about books is that the publisher, it's it's all about money in the sense of like it's not just having a great story idea. Like it has to actually have mainstream appeal to be able to sell. Um, and so for me, that's just a different mindset, right? Like when I pick my stories for long form, I'm thinking, what is the great human story? What is interesting? Like, I'm not thinking about what is going to sell or whatever. So it took a really long time to try to figure it out. I got really frustrated. And I said, if a book is for me, it will, it will happen organically. I can't, I'm not, yeah. I'm, I'm just going to pause on like trying to come up with the topic. And when I did this story on, um, Giannis's youngest brother at that point, like the family, the the way it is now with like, you know, they have their companies, they're very uh, front facing the family. It was, it was more of like a Milwaukee niche thing. Like you knew he had um, younger brothers, you knew that he loved his brothers, but it wasn't like this national um, thing. And and the brothers were not front facing, honestly. And so it was more like, i was like, oh, he has a fourth brother? Like, I didn't even know that. He was like 15. Um, And so I just started with the question of like, I wonder how difficult that is being the fourth. Like that, that's a lot of pressure, you know, like, and Giannis hadn't even won his first MVP. He was like a budding superstar, but it wasn't like Giannis the way it is now. And um, so I just, I, I go to his house and then Giannis happens to be there which I was like so shocked because I don't know. I just, I assumed like, there's no way I'm going to get him. Like I, I'm just going to focus on the younger brother. Like I'm sure Giannis is like out doing superstar things, you know, Giannis <laughs> just, things. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like, I'm like, there's no way he's going to be there. And then, and then I ended up turning into like a full day of like, you know, spending the day with them and the mom was there and Costas, the other brother was there And, you know, I'm going through my notes afterwards and I'm, you know, doing the process that we just talked about, like, what is this story really about? And I realized I was like, this is not a profile of Alex. This is a profile of a family. Um, And so that's why when you read the story, it tells you as much about Giannis as it does Alex. And so the wheels just started turning because so much was cut from that story. And I was like, you know, I really feel like there's so much here that I didn't get to say this this feels like a book. Like this feels interesting to me Um, because so much about Greece, you know, at that point, the only thing known was like, he sold trinkets on the street. Um, What does that like? Literally, what does that mean? And how do you get from trinkets on the street to 
you know, near MVP. So I was like, there's, right, a, there's, there's a more huge, to that story. <laughs> there's, yeah. yeah, there's a huge information gap. Right. And like, yeah. knowing what I know about like, you know, Europe and, and I just knew like, it could not have been easy for, you know, a black immigrant um, family. And so I was like, why is that story not told? So I had gotten introduced to a literary agent earlier that year, like maybe like six months before and I gave him ideas and he he, he said, my door's always open for you, but I, I just don't think these are the ones. So again, it's like that hustle. And then I came back and I was like, I just wrote this. I just feel like there's this is a human story that will connect with people. It's a family story. Like, what do you think? And so he agreed that, you know, this had legs. Um, I realize I'm talking a lot, but um, fast forwarding. No, you're good. To your, yeah. Fa fast forwarding to your point about. Um, there's a lot of ice cream in here. There's a lot of ice cream in here. Don't worry. There's, 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 it's not hollow at all. You're good. <laughs> so much. Um, and so fast forwarding. Um, so like the Disney movie that they had was like already in, you know, the um, the, the rise, the Disney plus movie that mm -hmm. I feel like that was the works for like five years plus, like even before I did that story. So, you know, to your point, like athletes are just kind of like, well, we have our own things. So, you know, we don't necessarily like need to do stuff that, you know, aren't, you know, our brand or our business. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was like, absolutely fine. Um, and I got to interview the family again. So that again, like, when you're when you're hustling and you're reporting, you try to interview as many people as possible. So I interviewed the brothers yeah. again, you know, interviewed all the people close and around. Um, the unfortunate thing was that the timing of it was such that obviously we didn't know that it would be the championship. We we obviously didn't know they'd win the championship, but the book was supposed to come out when it was supposed to come out because that was free agency. And at the time when I proposed the book, um, he was going like the biggest question was, is he going to stay or is he going to leave? And so that that was supposed to be the timing. Now, as a result, the Bucks who, you know, may were, were facing losing potentially the cornerstone of their franchise, like obviously like they're not going to want to help or do any media for this person mm. that you know, is in this very tenuous situation. Um, so unfortunately, like that was hard. And also people didn't want to be seen as tampering in any way. Like, okay, if I let uh -huh. you interview the person or does that mean you're asking about the free agency, which I was like, I swear to God, I'm just asking about skinny Giannis circa 2014. <laughs> um, but, right. but, you know, so you dealt with that, but at the same time, there were so many sources available to me. Um, and I did end up talking with many, many people within the books, you know, just without the PR's help, but, I found that the richest story was back in Greece. And so for me, it's kind of like the same approach. Like I said, like I loved playing defense, right? Because that's effort. I can call 50 people. I can call 50 more. Um, I'm not going to get bored. Hmm. I'm getting tired, but I'm going to keep going. So that's a if, word. Yeah. I'm so call if 50 so, people, I can call 50 yeah. more. I ain't getting bored. I like that. I like you that. Know, I'm like, that down if, too. If, <laughs> Yeah, it's like if somebody is going to say no to me, like, OK, that's reality. I respect that. But I still have a job to do. It's still do. So I'm still calling people. So I guess it was the perfect time to write a book. It was during COVID. Um, I was locked in my apartment and I was just calling people from Greece at like 6 a.m. <laughs> L.A. <time>. <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 awesome. That's that's good stuff. Um, fast forward to this off season, OK? Um I wonder how everybody had an opinion when uh, the Bucks were bouncing the first round by the Heat. Everybody, including yours truly, had an opinion about Giannis's viral. There are no, there, there is no such thing as failure. Only steps to success. Comments. A lot of people celebrated it. A lot of people were like, "Come on, man! Like, <laughs> let's not get to a point where we're eliminating failure as a concept, for, you know, from sports or from life, because it's." Anyway, I, I could go on and on about that. I would love to know how you process that moment, that commentary, given how well you know Giannis uh, and given his rise from selling trinkets on the street <laughs> and, and much more. Right. Uh, but, just, but just how you process not just what he had to say from his very legitimate perspective, um, but also just how it was received uh, nationally. I mean, um, it's funny because as soon as I saw it, I had this 
exact, I had a, a reaction and then I looked to Twitter and I saw that Bomani Jones had my exact reaction. So definitely going to credit him here. But I was with him when he said that, you know, it should, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember exactly what mm -hmm. he said, but my sentiment was like, of course, somebody who comes from where right. he comes from is not going to look at it the way that everyone else does, right? Like there's yes. an anecdote in my book that I immediately thought of, which was, him counting his Oreos rookie year, noticing that a staffer took them from his apartment because just because you signed a million dollars doesn't mean you shed the scarcity mindset that you lived your whole life with. You're going to count your Oreos. Right. You're going to know how much you have at all times. So of course he's not going to look at failure like everyone else because it's like he is the definition of success. But I think both sides are right right? Like yes. the, the basketball world, they're right. And he's right. There's not one right, you know, yeah. can be seen as a failure from an, a basketball standpoint, because of course that was, uh, I mean, but, but not also there was uh, extraneous factors, injuries, all these things. Sure. So, so I, I think everyone can be right. Um, but to me, yeah, to me, I, I speak with a lot of like, like not just universities, but young people, like young readers yeah. and yeah. and they, to see what that speech meant to them was so important. So I just think that it can serve a purpose for everyone. That can be a valid thing to say that can affect, you know, and inspire children. And yes, obviously the books clearly like did not do what they were supposed to do. And those people are right as well. Both can be true. Well, and I think both are true because in some ways, it, I think both sides are saying the same thing. Yeah. Because And I will get on my soapbox just for a second. My issue with it was not, uh, uh, yes, that's a great life lesson. And Giannis, certainly, you under, not only do you understand why he would see things that way, but deserves to see things that way, if that makes sense, if I'm using that right. I think the problem is that failure is a bad word to mm -hmm, some people, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it shouldn't be. There's a, it shouldn't be a negative connotation to failure. I know inherently it's negative, but I think, and this is what Giannis is doing, if we flip it on its head, like failure is necessary, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and I don't wanna live in a world, or I don't wanna live a life without failure, quite honestly. You know, because I mean, obviously, Tom. I think Tom Brady is one of the people who says we don't lose, we learn. So I think mm -hmm. we're kind of all saying similar versions of the same thing, just packaged differently. Um, but moving on from Giannis, or not from Giannis, but now looking into his future, he has a new coach. Mike Boonholz is gone. Adrian Griffin, you know, no head coaching experience. I love to know, again, given what you know about Giannis, how you think he's poised to lead this organization. Uh, through uncharted waters, so to speak. I mean, At least he for him. was. You're right. Yeah. No. I mean, he was somebody that Giannis wanted. So the, you know, he's got to have it. So work ethic is like a word that really gets thrown around. But I think Giannis work ethic, as we all know now, is very different from normal work ethic. So whatever Giannis work ethic is, is the same one that his coach has to mirror. So I absolutely know mm -hmm. that. You know, from top down, you're going to have that same hunger and desire and nothing is given to you and um, work for everything and, um, you know, don't think you've arrived. So I, I actually, I mean, if he, if this is somebody that he has, you know, really advocated for and wanted to, then he, he has that absolutely. Um, and not being satisfied. And maybe to your point, like looking at failure and all of these things a little bit differently. Um, I, I tend to be one of the people who say that he will be successful no matter where he goes or who he plays for. Right. But I do think that, you know, they must have a bond that goes beyond yeah. basketball. If all else fails, he can go to Saudi Arabia and make $700 million for one year. That was a great, he's Hi. so funny. He's so he's funny. So and he does funny. look like Mbappe. I know. I was like, oh my God, I cannot, I cannot. But that's why when he people does say look like well, that's why when people say like, oh, like, can he be the face of the league? I'm like, what do you want in your face of the league? He He's yeah. so marketable. He's so funny. He's so kind. 
he's so intense, so driven, so hungry. You know, it, it's just got the full spectrum of the modern yeah. super. You know, because how many superstars do we know are amazing at basketball? Personality flat, like or personality yeah. so so uh, big and vivacious, and then the game doesn't match. I mean, he's like the rare person yeah. that has. Hey, thanks so much for kicking it with your main man, Michael Smith. Be sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel, but also subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast. Rate it, review it, tell your friends about it. Oh, and be sure to follow me on social media.